Good morning, everyone. Um, so as you can probably tell, I'm not Nirbik. Um, unfortunately, Nirbik got dengue fever uh, so a few days ago, so he couldn't actually make it. But uh, we'll wish him all the best. Hope he gets healthy soon. So I was asked to give this presentation on a few days' notice. Um, so I just threw some random stuff together. Um, if you have questions, feel free to speak up. Uh, this is more of like an informal thing. So I'm going to talk to you about medicine, and, and, and I wanted to like condense. So, what, how would you describe it in brief? And I'm going to quote a conversation that happened at Guadec 2016. This was a uh, Saturday during the, the party. So uh, during Guadec, I wrote a proof of concept port of TTK to use Mesen, and, and, and I had a picture on my phone, and I was showing it to people. Uh, and then Emmanuel asked, so how long does it take to compile? And I answered that it takes about a few minutes. And things were quiet for a while. And then Alberto said this, I have never seen Emmanuel smile before. <laughs> uh, and this is kind of like a very condensed version of Metan is all, what it's all about. Because all of you, like, like I assume most of you are coders. And like if you're using your editor, and you get kind of a zen feeling. And it kind of feels nice to be working with it. But no one has really, up to this point, said so the build system is like really great. The best quote, the best possible thing you could have heard is that the one that I'm using is not as terrible as all the others. But like, there's no reason why this, this needs to be the case. Like, why couldn't it be good and feel nice and actually work? So this is the, the main design points that we had. Uh, and here are some design goals in a nutshell. So uh, Linux, OS 10, BSD. Uh, Android, iPhone, all these things which are modern, and all the tools, these, these are need to be supported out of the box, single definition. Uh, support all the compilers, GCC, Clang, Visual Studio, ICC. We have support about to seven different Fortran compilers, which uh, some guy who was doing uh, physics work uh, sent us, which is kind of cool. And, and try to hide as many platform differences as possible. Um, when this is not possible, it's just then expose directly that these are sorts of things that you as a developer need to actually do something about because we can't automatically decide what to do. Um, and out of the box support for modern tools, so things like uh, address sanitizer, uh, running unit tests under Valgrind, uh, uh, scan build, which is the, the static analyzer that's, that ships with Clang, all these other things. And these should be just out of the box. You just say, I just want to use this thing as, as opposed to copying the thousand line of, of make and shell and M4 into from one place to another and hope that it works because like that's just a waste of effort. And most importantly, the, the architectural designs are not based on the user land of Sun OS 3.5. Um, I never used it. I'm sure it was great, but maybe it's just like time to let it die and move on to something more modern. And so the talk was about portability and and how to compile your GNOME apps everywhere, and. If you compile uh, your any, any application on multiple platforms, there are two problems that you're going to have to face. It's the tooling that you use, and then there's the dependencies that you have. And these are the, uh, the real problems. And on, on Linux, this is, of course, not a problem, because you get all of this from your distro. But on other platforms, it's a lot more difficult, because you can't get packages and all that good stuff. Um, about a year ago, um, this was this, the situation of dependencies in GNOME. As far as I can tell, if someone knows better, please let me know. So glib build depends on both Python and Perl, uh, and a bunch of other things as well. Uh, glib mk enums is written in Perl. So whenever you compile something that uses mk enums, you need to have Perl installed, or otherwise it just doesn't work. Uh, GTK doc is, is also written in Perl. In fact, you don't really need that like for day-to-day -day development, but it's, it's a tool that you need. It's, and it's, good, it's a good thing, um, but it's, it's in Perl and it hasn't really been touched in about 10 years. And uh, most packages build with auto tools, which depends only on, on shell and make, um, and a few other things if you actually start looking into what it does. Um, there's a command called the universe. I don't know what it does. I'm sure it's important. But this is like a fairly hefty set of dependencies which is usually just glossed over by saying, well, it's, it doesn't actually depend on anything. You just need the shell. Um, well, fast forward to today. 
Uh, so glib tooling is in Python, as far as I can tell. Is this tool? The, the, like the, the MK enums has been ported to Python. And I, is, is there a build dependency still on Perl for glib? Anyone? Okay, probably not. Uh, GTK doc is now in Python. Um, and I think there's also a release, which is in Python, and, and the Perl bit is, is, has been dropped away completely. And if you compile your code with Mesen, then the only dependency that we have is Python, uh, because that's what it's implemented in. And there's it, uh, we have a very specific rule that we are not allowed to depend on anything that's not inside Python standard library. So if you have Python standard li library in installation, you will work on that. So this gives us something on the order of the Highlander, because the only, only dependency that you have for building no applications, um, maybe not today, but like very soon, is that you need Python 3, and you don't need anything else. Uh, at least for something like core, where you just depend on glib and, and one of these libraries. And this makes everything massively simpler, because then, then uh, you just install Python 3, and everything works. And you get rid of the shell, which is uh, always a good thing. And there are lots of people who like the shell, but it, uh, in fact, it is a disaster on all possible counts. Um, if you ever laughed at people for downloading stuff with curl and running it with the shell, and you have run a configure script from a, from a file you downloaded from the internet, you don't get to laugh at them because it's exactly the same thing. Configure f files are in fact statically linked binaries if you like think about how they work. It's just a random bunch of stuff and you hope that what's there is not, hasn't been trojaned. And they're extremely slow. Um, on Linux, it's not that bad, but if you need to support something like Windows, and if you run configure scripts and it's like testing thing, testing another thing, testing a third thing, it's just like takes forever. Um, shell scripts are hard to write because they're full of tricky corner cases, and the syntax by itself is, is not very nice. Uh, even harder to debug. Who here has to debug a configure script that does the wrong thing? How many of you have enjoyed it? <laughs> Zero? Oh, there's, <laughs> there's one guy. Okay, good. <laughs> Points to you. <laughs> um, shell scripts are not portable. If you think they're portable, you don't, like, haven't actually, because the, all the tools that the shell scripts use are different on every platform. So they're completely different, and, and you need to do all the magic. Like, so is this, this version of Orc or whatever? And um, on Windows, you can't run shell scripts because it doesn't ship natively. Um, and perhaps the biggest problem, so th these are all things that you can live with. But the pr main problem of shell scripts is that it's a massive barrier to entry for any new developer. If you don't know about the shell already, it's really like an uphill battle. And just getting rid of that makes it much, so much simpler for new people to start contributing. And shell scripts are very terrible. So let's, let's do a, like a sim simple show of hands. Um, I'm going to show a shell script snippet, which uh, displays a certain feature. And um, when you see it, read it. And if you think you know the depth of the rabbit hole, where it actually goes, to all the way to the end, raise your hand. All right, ready? <laughs> okay, I see one. Okay, two more. Okay. Um, now, okay. So there are a few people, but the, the, um, for those of you who don't know, uh, if you write shell scripts and then you have an if statement, and there's this, this opening bracket, this is not a shell built in thing. This is an executable. If you look in the user bin left bracket, it's an executable that you run. Every single time you do any sort of testing, you spawn a process to do that. So if you do a string comparison, it's a string. It's, it's you spawn a process to do a string comparison. Um, it's, and this is, it, it is the original Docker where you can spawn st string comparisons into standalone executables for safety as demonstrated here by Habak. Um, but let's move on to the, the other thing which is perhaps more important, which is dependencies. Um, and in Mesen, we have is a dependency provider system. 
Um, is LibreOffice being okay? So the point is that if you have a Mesen project, then you can build it as a sandbox sub project of any other project, where you can take existing things, put them inside your own thing, and just build them there. Uh, any dependency that you have, it can come from the system, so like with package config or any of that, or you can build it yourself. And the important thing is that the build definitions for this are the same. So the part that say, basically you say, I want this dependency, and then where it comes from, you don't have to care about in your build definitions. And this works on all the platforms, uh, Windows, OS X, Android, and you can use it on Flatpak if you want to, and you, or you can use the Flatpak way of providing dependencies if you want to, whatever works best for you. And the only dependency for, for this to work is that the dependency that you're using has been ported to work on the platform you want to run it on. And this is very similar to what uh, Rust's Cargo do, and D has one, and Go has one, and, and Node.js, and all those other things. But the point about this is that this is not tied to a specific language. This is language agnostic. We, it can work with any, any dependency for any language that, you, that we currently support. And it, you can add support for new languages as well. And we, we also have this thing called uh, RapDB, which is kind of like a flat hub for source code. So basically what I have is, is there are tarballs of, of source code for the upstream files. And then an, an in addition to that, there's kind of like Debian has the extra diff for the Debian definitions. Then we have the extra diff for the Mesen definitions. And then you can just say, I want this dependency, and then it downloads it and builds it. And there's going to be a, uh, a demo a bit later. Um, and this is done with full cooperations with the Linux distro packages. And, and this actually makes things easier for packagers because uh, if people use this mechanism, then it's very clear where their dependencies are. And you don't, as a distro package, you don't have to go hunting through all the things where, like, is there possibly a place somewhere in here where they have embedded some other library and not told any, everyone? Uh, by default, it downloads the dependencies from the internet. Um, if you are in, in restricted environments, you can give it an, a command line argument that turns this into an error. So it never downloads anything unless you actually want it to. Um, so let's look at the demo. So I wrote this uh, simple application. If you want to look at the actual code, this is inside the Mesen repository. Uh, so there's a, a simple program that compiles a link with Lua, and it's a script that opens PNG files. So it depends on libpng as well, and libpng depends on zlib to do the actual final bit of compression. Um, so this is what it looks like. So you have uh, this, uh, this is the, the path if you want to go look, look into it. So it's a build definition file. Uh, there's a C file which does the actual thing. Um, the contents of that are not very important. And then there's the sub-projects folder which we're going to look into a bit later. Uh, the build definition file looks like this. So as you say that this is a project, uh, this is user C, and there's the default option for the C standard version. And then we have two dependencies, for one for Lua and one for PNG. And this is the, the Mesen shorthand for, for saying that I want a dependency on Lua. Try to look it up in the system, and if it's not there, then use this sub-project as a fallback. And the same thing for PNG. And then we build an executable with that source, and we say that we want these dependencies. Right. So uh, if you look at the sub-project directory, it's very simple. So all the only things that are there are these co what's called wrap files, one for each dependency that we want to download. Uh, the contents of that look very simple. So basically, it's just some URLs and hash hashes. Uh, and then it, the system downloads it, unpacks it, uh, ver verifies that the hash is correct, unpacks it, and then runs it. Um, so this is what it looks like when you actually do it. So here we, it's, it's uh, taken uh, libpng, and it's, it's downloading it from the, from the uh, upstream location. And it's downloading the patch for that. And then it's uh, doing all the magic. And uh, there you can see the project name libpng. It means that it's, it's extracted it, and it's gone inside and started configuring libpng for building. Uh, note also that it says native dependency zlib. So in this case, zlib was found on the system, so there's no need to download it and use it. 
So in this case, Lua uh, and libpng are, are self-compiled, and zlib is used from the system. But it could be any combination of them. And so here's a slightly different uh, invocation of the same thing. So in this case, uh, it has downloaded Lua from the internet. So this, it, depending on which dependencies are available, it just works the thing. And then uh, there's the 39 slash 39 means that it's, it's done 39 compiled steps, and now the thing is compiled. And this thing has work, works the same if you're on Linux, if you're on, on OS 10, if you're on Windows, if you cross-compile, it doesn't really matter because the only thing that matters is that you tell it that I want this dependency and then it gets done. Um, there's a different, oh, question. So the so question was that can you specify a git repo? So yes, you, yes you can. And you can also specify an HT repository if you want to. So that's just a different kind of wrap file. So if you point for you, which is which is your uh, house? Purple one. Purple one, okay, good. First question always gets a star. Purple, all right. Now, um, so the question is that if you're using uh, something like uh, Rust or, or D or something, and they have these their uh, own packaging system, then why wouldn't you use them? And the thing is that if you are doing a pure Rust project or so you're doing a pure D project or something like that, you probably want to. It's, it, they are very good tools for the things that they're meant to. But there are limitations. That they work very well for their own language, and they might have some sort of shim support for building plain C, but they don't support any of the other ones. Um, and if you want to actually really good about it, you would have to implement full C and C++ build support for your favorite tool, and, and is this something that you want to do as a person who has done this? No, it isn't. You don't want to do this. You want to, someone else to do it instead, because it's a lot of work. And this is perhaps a bit controversial, but C as an implementation language is, is diminishing. It's, eventually, it's going to go away. Although, well, there's going to be always stuff using C, but it, it's, it's going to be diminishing. But what will remain, probably forever, is the C ABI. Because for, for shared library communication, it's actually pretty good. And so what probably will happen, unless something crazy happens, is that there's going to be components that are implemented in different languages, but they expose a C ABI. So, so you have some lib A, which is in D, or lib B, which is in Rust, and lib C, which is in C, and, and so on and so on. Then you can just mix and match them. And the thing here is that if every single system has their own build system, then be they become silos, and combining them becomes harder. So if, if, you, if you could have one for use in all of them, or you could just say the type of thing that you want, and then if the system would take care of the rest, it would cut down on, on the work quite a lot. Um, going further, so the earlier, uh, yesterday there was the mention that, w that in GNOME we don't do hacks, we fix things properly. Um, since I have the stage, now there's some things which are broken that I wish people would fix. Um, I really can't fix them because I don't have the necessary skills. But um, the main one is the linker situation. Uh, out of all the tools in the modern uh, Linux distribution that are widely in use, the linker is perhaps the oldest and gnarliest. Uh, it has interesting limitations. So uh, in 1973, it made sense if you link static libraries, and it looks up all of the symbols that you use. And it then, once it's finished with that, it throws away the rest because it saves memory. And then when you get, get on forward, uh, then you need, if you have another dependency that uses different part of the A file, you need to specify it twice because otherwise it doesn't work. And it's just like complete disaster. And it would mu make much more sense to have just like one, you can specify all the li libraries once and then the linker would take care of everything else because um, otherwise it's just terrible. Um, name mangling, it's also, um, it's, it, it's a necessary evil, uh, at least up until this point. Uh, it allows you to use system design for something else to for something better. Um, it, but it has like major problems. Uh, as an interesting, as, uh, so the D day mangling scheme is such that uh, it's possible to, that you get a symbol whose name is megabytes in size. I think they fixed it since, but like it's just completely crazy. And the problem with this is that because the, the linker is based only on strings and nothing else, there's not really much else you can do. So if you wanted to fix this, then we need to have some sort of 
um, better understanding of, of the of the like understanding that this is an actually a, something like a C++ library, and you could say have some higher level description of the thing, and then the leaker would work on that. But it's it's going to be quite a lot of work, and I don't think anyone's working on it at the moment. At least no one has for the past 40 years. Um, different std lib C++ versions uh, in the same executable or the same binary it should work. So if you have dependency that links against different versions of lib standard C++, you get interesting bugs, and then you get sad. Um, glibc has a split where uh, math libraries and uh, DL and a bunch of other ones are in their own standalone libraries. Uh, and in this, it's pretty much unique because every other C library has them all in the plain libc. Uh, Windows does this, OS X does this, uh, Musil does this, all, all the modern ones. And the amount of time and effort it takes for people to add in those LM flags is just like incredible, and, and there's really no point. It made kind of sense in 1982 when there wasn't as much memory, but just like just merge them because it will make everything so much simpler. And also like pthread, uh, you need to have the pthread uh, compiler flags if you want threads. And now nowadays almost every application is thread, so maybe it makes sense to have something like if you really want to have a non-threaded one, you need to just say no threads, and then it would do the, the right thing. But uh, like getting all, the, all these flags correct all the time, and ev every single project has to fight with these. And it's like, well, can we just like actually make it work properly? Um, Windows would, uh, probably not, nobody here can fix it, but if there are people from Microsoft watching, get this fixed. Uh, so in Windows, a the API for spawning a process uh, doesn't actually take an array. It takes a string, which is a shell invocation. And that's passed on all the way to the kernel, I think. I'm not entirely sure. So there's no possible way to, to give it array of things. So, and you just have to do magic quoting, and it's very short, and, and it's just complete and utter disaster. And, and getting this fixed would be awesome. So there are actually libc functions for doing the execv spawn, but they don't actually work. They just concatenate things with spaces and call the actual thing. Um, the Xcode file format is so amazingly terrible that you wish it was XML, and that's, that's really saying something. Um, I think e Apple is working on a new build system uh, for their things. Um, it would be great. Uh, Xcode is um, it's very hostile for uh, uh, working with other people. It's not, cooperation is not the thing that it does well. It would be really great if it did. Um, okay, um, so that's five minutes. Okay, so uh, closing. So there are a few ideas and, and things that I've been thinking about. Oh. So uh, we're going to have an uh, MSI installer package for Windows. So basically what you do is that you just install that and it ships as an executable and you can just use Mesin and run it and it's, it's going to be fine. You don't have to work, worry about installing Python and all that sort of stuff. So this makes, makes things easier. Um, it would be nice if there was a full new tool chain uh, as an MSI package uh, that doesn't try to ship its own entire user and thing. There, there are a few implementations, but they're usually a bit outdated. But something like MinGW, full installation, just the compiler executables as one thing, it would be nice. It's like very easy to install, and it would be nice, nice to get, get new people using, using the thing. Um, this is an idea that I, I just occurred to me a few days ago. So like a simple web page on, on how do you do the steps needed to compile source code into executables. Like this is how you install this dependency and this is what you want to use. And very simple, so for new people. Which is the thing that doesn't do clicks. It would be nice for, for getting new people in. Um, wrap database, which mentioned, um, it could use help. So there were, uh, if there are people who want to volunteer to run that, it would be great. Um, this is a bit of a black mark. Uh, as far as I can tell, I'm not entirely sure because of GitHub usernames aren't usually very informative. But as far as I can tell, there are no contributors from women. We would like to have those. And we're going to take part in the next uh, outreach. So hopefully things get better, better on this count. Um, and world domination is progressing. Because there are actually people now who write hate blog posts about Mesin. So achievement. <laughs> All right. Uh, 
uh, on Monday, there's going to be uh, the unconverted thing, uh, talking about new features. If you want help in porting your project to Messen, uh, talk about the use cases, complain nothing works, or just have fun, uh, feel free to join. Uh, but most importantly, there are stickers. If you want one, come talk to me afterwards. Right. Uh, if there are any questions, I'll be happy to take them. All right, so you can just come find me afterwards. <laughs>